The scourge of our planet today is a small group of rogue regimes that violate every principle on which the United Nations is based. They respect neither their own citizens nor the sovereign rights of their countries. If the righteous many do not confront the wicked few, then evil will triumph. When decent people and nations become bystanders to history, the forces of destruction only gather power and strength. No one has shown more contempt for other nations and for the well-being of their own people than the depraved regime in North Korea. It is responsible for the starvation deaths of millions of North Koreans and for the imprisonment, torture, killing, and oppression of countless more. We were all witness to the regime's deadly abuse when an innocent American college student, Otto Warmbier, was returned to America only to die a few days later. We saw it in the assassination of the dictator's brother using banned nerve agents in an international airport. We know it kidnapped a sweet 13-year-old Japanese girl from a beach in her own country to enslave her as a language tutor for North Korea's spies. If this is not twisted enough, now North Korea's reckless pursuit of nuclear weapons and ballistic missiles threatens the entire world with unthinkable loss of human life. It is an outrage that some nations would not only trade with such a regime, but would arm, supply, and financially support a country that imperils the world with nuclear conflict. No nation on Earth has an interest in seeing this band of criminals arm itself with nuclear weapons and missiles. The United States has great strength and patience. But if it is forced to defend itself or its allies, we will have no choice but to totally destroy North Korea. Rocket Man is on a suicide mission for himself and for his regime. The United States is ready willing and able. But hopefully, this will not be necessary. That's what the United Nations is all about. That's what the United Nations is for. Let's see how they do. Before going into the main points in my debate, I feel forced to make comments on the speech uttered four days ago by someone called the U.S. President that rendered this sacred UN arena tainted. Since Trump uttered such reckless and violent words provoking the supreme dignity of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea at this very platform, I think it is fair enough for me to make a response in the corresponding tone. During his eight months in power, he has turned the White House into a noisy marketing place full of crackling sounds of abacus bees, and now he has tried to turn the UN arena into a gangster's nest where money is respected and bloodshed is the order of the day. The absurd reality that a person like Trump, a mentally deranged person full of megalomania and complacence, the person who is chastised even by American people as commander in grief, lion king, president evil, is holding the seat of the U.S. president and the dangerous reality that the gambler who grew old using threats, frauds, and all other schemes to acquire a patch of land holds the nuclear button. These are what constitute the gravest threat to the international peace and security today. It is time for North Korea to realize that the denuclearization is its only acceptable future. The United Nations Security Council recently held two unanimous 15 to nothing votes
adopting hard-hitting resolutions against North Korea. And I want to thank China and Russia for joining the vote to impose sanctions, along with all of the other members of the Security Council. Thank you to all involved. But we must do much more. It is time for all nations to work together to isolate the Kim regime until it ceases its hostile behavior. Due to his lacking of basic common knowledge and proper sentiment, he tried to insult the supreme dignity of my country by referring it to a rocket. By doing so, however, he committed an irreversible mistake of making our rockets visit to the entire U.S. mainland inevitable all the more. None other than Trump himself is on a suicide mission. In case innocent lives of the U.S. are harmed because of this suicide attack, Trump will be held totally responsible. The respected Supreme Leader of the DPRK, Comrade Kim Jong-un, stated, as a man representing the DPRK and on behalf of the dignity and honor of my state and people and on my own, I will make the man holding the prerogative of the Supreme Command in the U.S. pay dearly for his speech calling for totally destroying the DPRK. Trump might not have been aware what is uttered from his mouth, but we will make sure that he bears consequences far beyond his words, far beyond the scope of what he can handle even if he is ready to do so. Due to high-handedness and arbitrariness of one particular big power, however, at present, the purpose and principles of the UN Charter and other established basic principles of international relations are now wantonly ignored in the UN arena. Abnormal acts justifying and legitimizing high-handedness and arbitrariness and acts of violating truth and justice are conceived at or tolerated. The most rampant violation of international justice can be seen on the Korean Peninsula. Unprecedented acts of injustice, such as imposing harsh sanctions on a victim for the reason that the victim chose to stand up to the offender, are openly committed in the name of the UN. The instance of the situation on the Korean Peninsula is a confrontation between the DPRK and the US, where the former tries to defend its national dignity and sovereignty against the latter's hostile policy and nuclear threats. The United States is the country that first produced nuclear weapons and the only country that actually used it, massacring hundreds of thousands of innocent civilians. It is the U.S. that threatened to use nuclear weapons against the DPRK during the Korean War in 1950s and first to introduce nuclear weapons into the Korean Peninsula after the war. The U.S. started large-scale joint military exercises against the DPRK during the Cold War period and further increased their scope and aggressive nature after the Cold War, staging the exercises several times a year by mobilizing more of nuclear strategic assets. What else could be a bigger threat than the violent remarks such as pouring fire and fury, total destruction, coming from the top authority of the world's biggest nuclear power. The very reason the DPRK had to possess nuclear weapons is because of the U.S., and it had to strengthen and develop its nuclear force onto the current level to cope with the U.S. The U.S. hostile policy and nuclear threats have continued over 70 years and these have led the situation on the Korean Peninsula to a touch-and-go point. But in the United Nations, unjustifiable resolutions which illegalize justice as injustice are randomly adopted due to the high-handedness of the U.S. The respected Supreme Leader 
Comrade Kim Jong-un, Chairman of the State Affairs Commission of the DPRK, said, International justice is never achieved by itself. It can only be achieved when the anti-imperialist independent countries are strong enough. Unless true international justice is realized, the only valid philosophical principle is that force must be dealt with force and nuclear weapons of tyranny must be dealt with nuclear hammer of justice. The possession of nuclear deterrence by the DPRK is a righteous self-defensive measure taken as an ultimate option pursuant to this principle. Recently, the DPRK has successfully conducted ICBM-mountable H-bomb test as a part of the efforts to achieve the goal of completing the state nuclear force. With this, the DPRK has entered a phase of completing the state nuclear force in accordance with its line of simultaneous development of the economy and the nuclear force. Our national nuclear force is to all intents and purposes a war deterrent for putting an end to nuclear threat of the U.S. and for preventing its military invasion. And our ultimate goal is to establish the balance of power with the U.S. Distinguished delegates of all countries attending this session are aware of the fact that the DPRK, unlike other nuclear weapon states, made public every time to the world the test process and its result in all stages of the development and advancement of its nuclear force. Since the war deterrent for safeguarding peace and security of the Korean Peninsula and the region is strengthened enough, the United States and its followers must now think twice before launching military provocation against the DPRK. Although they talk about fire and fury, total destruction and whatever, every time they have to add various conditions such as hopefully this will not be necessary, that is not our first option and so on. Accordingly, we are convinced that peace and security of the North East Asia and the region as a whole have been as much consolidated. We do not need anyone's recognition of our status as a nuclear weapon state and our capability of nuclear strike. The ICBM marked with sacred name of the DPRK flew over the universe above the endless blue sky. The warhead of our rocket left its trace on the blue waves of the Pacific Ocean and the tremendous explosion and vibration of the hydrogen bomb were recorded by this planet. Although our decision to possess nuclear weapons was an inevitable choice option forced by the United States, it resulted in our country achieving the status of nuclear weapon state and a rocket power. And this prestige has now become an immortal destiny of the DPRK. Mr. President, the failure of the United Nations in fulfilling its role in realizing genuine international justice is primarily related to the undemocratic democratic old practices of the Security Council. It is none other than the Security Council which disregards the UN Charter from the very first article and only acts in pursuit of the will and interest of its permanent member states. It is not incidental that the issue on reform of the Security Council had already been decided in 1992 by Resolution 47-62 at the 47th session of the UNGA. Since then, the UNSC reform issue has been discussed at the UNGA every year during the past 25 years, but without any progress at all. This fact itself clearly shows how deeply the current prominent members are obsessed in their anachronistic vested interests. One permanent member alone can veto the general will of over 190 UN member states. Such an undemocratic UN organ is the Security Council. At this forum, I would like to once again remind all the distinguished delegates of the unjust and unfair nature of the resolutions adopted by the Security Council against the DPRK. First, the Security Council 
fabricated illegal and double standard resolutions which only prohibit the satellite launch of the DPRK and violation of the international law prescribing peaceful use of outer space as a sovereign right of every state and without taking any issue with all other satellite launching countries. Second, the Security Council cooked up illegal and double standard resolutions which arbitrarily prohibit only the nuclear tests of the DPRK, although nuclear test strictly belongs to the sovereignty of every state, since the international law on prohibition of nuclear test has not yet entered into force. And there are countries that conducted many more nuclear tests. Third, the Security Council condemned the development of nuclear weapons by the DPRK as a threat to international peace and security and on that basis fabricated illegal and double, double standard resolutions in contravention of Article 51 of the UN Charter which recognizes the right to self-defense of every state and without calling into question the other countries that kept on developing latest nuclear weapons of various kinds. The reason these unjust and unfair resolutions continue to be adopted is that the permanent members of the Security Council, all nuclear powers, have common interest in maintaining their monopolistic nuclear status. The permanent members of UNSC are talking much about non-proliferation of nuclear weapons. But viewed from the aspect of nuclear non-proliferation, the DPRK's possession of nuclear weapons is a righteous self-defensive measure. Actually, the international agreement on nuclear non-proliferation was possible because the nuclear weapon states had made the promise not to threaten non-nuclear weapon states with the nuclear weapons. Article 10 of the NPT stipulates that each party shall have the right to withdraw from the treaty if it decides that its supreme interests have been jeopardized. This article recognizes that the supreme interests of states are above the nuclear non-proliferation. After all, the U.S. itself impeded the international efforts for nuclear non-proliferation by not giving up the nuclear threat against the DPRK, but rather compelling the latter to possess nuclear weapons. This eloquently shows that the anti-DPRK resolutions are not based on any established principles and that they are nothing less than the products of undemocratic old practices of the Security Council and the conspiracy and collusion of the forces obsessed only in their vested interests. The U.S. claims that the DPRK's possession of H-bomb and ICBM constitutes a global threat, even at the U.N. arena. But such claim is a big lie, which is just tantamount to the notorious big lie faked up by the U.S. in 2003 about the existence, of, existence in Iraq of weapons of mass destruction in order to invade that country. The Democratic People's Republic of Korea is a responsible nuclear weapon state. We will take preventative measures by merciless preemptive action in case the U.S. and its vessel forces show any sign of conducting a kind of decapitating operation on our headquarters or military attack against our country. However, we do not have any intention at all to use or threaten to use nuclear weapons against the countries that do not join in the U.S. military actions against the DPRK. The U.S. is resorting to an intrigue of condemning the DPRK's nuclear possession as a global threat in order to find a pretext for coercing other U.N. member states into implementing the anti-DPRK san sanctions resolutions. This is a sneaky and selfish attempt by the U.S. to avoid its responsibility for the nuclear issue of the Korean Peninsula and to pursue its own interests by using and sacrificing other countries that have nothing to do with the issue. The DPRK government made a request to the U.N. Secretariat that a forum of international law experts be organized to assess legal grounds and lawfulness of the UNSC resolutions, but we have not heard anything from the Secretariat for nine months already.
Same is true of the fact that the DPRK made repeated requests to the United Nations Security Council to discuss the serious threat to the international peace and security posed by the aggressive and provocative U.S.-South Korea large-scale joint military exercises, but these requests were never put on the UNSC agenda, rather turned down every time. The UN Charter stipulates that the members of the United Nations accept and carry out the decisions of the Security Council. If the resolutions on the DPRK adopted at the Security Council are truly lawful and fair, there will be no need that all U.S. ambassadors abroad and even the President and the State Secretary turn out to coerce other countries into implementing the resolutions. Furthermore, there will be no need for the U.S. to bring its stooges like South Korea and Japan into this. The UN member states should not yield in to pressure of an individual big power in dealing with the UNSC resolutions, but make an independent judgment on lawfulness, impartiality and morality of the resolutions and contribute to promoting reform of the UNSC by further raising their voices against high-handedness and arbitrariness. Mr. President, the U.S. had put sanctions against our country from the very first day of its foundation, and the over 70-year-long history of the DPRK can be said in a sense a history of struggle persevering along the road of self-development under the harshest sanctions in the world. Through such a prolonged and arduous struggle, now we are finally only a few steps away from the final gate of completion of the state nuclear force. It is only a forlorn hope to consider any chance that the DPRK would be shaken an inch or change its stance due to the harshest sanctions by the hostile forces. The day will certainly come in the near future when we settle all damages inflicted to our peaceful economic development and improvement of the people's livelihood and all the sufferings imposed on our innocent women, children and the elderly by the heinous and barbaric sanctions against our republic.